hope everyone's doing well this morning. It's beautiful. I don't know if you had the opportunity or noticed the uh, majestic scenery that God has given us here in Southern California, that we can look at the snow from far away and not have to dig out of it <laughs> like most of the nation, and that's, that's awesome. But um, you know, thank God for the rain and just uh, for this uh, winter-like weather. And you know what? I can't remember. Did, did time go back? Today or is that next Sunday? Is next Sunday? You know, it's 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 the one time. Look, this is how gracious God is. It's the one time of year, one time of year, that God shows mercy to those who are always late. Right? <laughs> he says, "Don't put your clock ahead, man. Just keep it there, and you'll be fine." You know, but uh, it, no, it's it's uh, it's nice to be able to get that time back. But um, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter fifteen. We're going to be studying verses 12 through 17, and the message today is is titled, The Decision to Love, The Decision to Love. This is probably by far, you know, um, and at least in this particular gospel, we know that Jesus, He is love. He came because of love. You know, the Bible tells us clearly that, you know, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You know, He is love. Um, he's a manifestation of the Father's, uh, a, a tangible manifestation of the Father's heart of who He is, His character. That's why He always says that He and the Father are one. You know, when He told Philip, if you've seen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's that expression, that tangible expression. And we know all about the life of Jesus Christ, that He had no sin, that He loved perfectly and purely, uh, there was no flaw in him, and 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 you know, but yet he's called us to live like he lived, and so that could be rather challenging, amen. I mean, you know, as human beings, we live in these you know carnal bodies and and sin riddled, and and it's uh, just at times just difficult to follow the Lord, but yet that's the command that He's given us. During the time of, uh, you know, we mentioned last week that the time up in the upper room came in an and they were, they were walking through Jerusalem on, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Lord eventually, if you read ahead in chapter 17, will be praying for the disciples and for us, you know, the future believers. And we talked about how he made the observation regarding the vine, you know, there on the, on the doors of the temple, and he shared that parable with them. And, and the story regarding staying plugged into the vine. That's, that's, where, that's where the success is going to be for us as Christians. Is staying close to the Lord. Staying connected to the main vine. And, and, and through that we'll bear much fruit. That's the calling of our life is to bear much fruit. Bear much fruit. And we uh, saw and, and reviewed certain verses regarding the different types of fruit in our life. But the primary one is seeing people come to the knowledge of salvation. Seeing people come uh, to, to that knowledge of freedom from the world, from sin, from the fear of death, and having our, our future secured, knowing that when we take our last breath here on this earth, that we will be present with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our Creator. And, and, and what that does to a life, you know? That all of a sudden, with that freedom, now we have a different outlook and we see things differently. And then we're called then to, to be servants, to serve Him, to live for Him. You know, he, he invites us to die to ourselves daily and to pick up our cross and follow Him. And so that's the life of a Christian. We left off last week in that verse 11 where He tells us through His Word that when we live in this manner, that it makes, it makes our joy or as it says here in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Full, without, without lacking. That when we're plugged in and living for the Lord, we lack nothing. You know, many of us can testify to that fact that, that you know, when we were in the world pursuing the things of the world, trying to get, you know, as the song says, satisfaction from the world, you know, that it just didn't pan out. It was quite the opposite. It, it would leave us more and more empty and desiring more and more. And, you know, once the flesh gets a taste of certain things, you have to keep pursuing that to get to that next high, so to speak. But yet Jesus says, 
and you know your joy is made full and complete you will lack nothing when you're plugged into me so in spite of your life circumstances that we could have that eternal joy. And we know that's a complete different thing than happiness because happiness is fleeting. We have happy moments. But joy is, is a presence inside that, that is not based on any outer circumstance, but it's all inner. And that's knowing Christ and He's dwelling in our hearts. So with that being set up, then Jesus moves on and He gives now this new challenge to the disciples and also to us this morning here in verse 12. He says, this is my commandment. This is my commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You know, if if we made this just our life verse, which maybe some of you have, this is just a life verse, and you set out to say, you know what, I'm just going to focus on this verse and let it manifest in my life. I'm going to do my best to live it out each and every day. This right here would keep you occupied. <laughs> this would stretch you literally, and it should rightfully stretch you for the rest of your life until you see Jesus. Because there's, there's great power in this. It, causes, it should cause consternation in our life every day. Not condemnation, but the consternation to say, you know what, let me have a heart check. Where am I in in relation to this command that Jesus has given to me as his follower, as a believer, as someone who's been loved first by him? And now in response, I want to love him and I want to obey. And it's a command. It's a command that's been given to us. Note here, it's, it's important to note, I should say, that this is now in a position or in a time in the conversation that he's having with the disciples that has moved away from the emotional aspect of things. Because remember, at the beginning of verse 14, right? He says, he addresses the fact that they're anxious. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Uh, uh, when your heart's troubled, it's, it's usually connected to high emotions. You know, you're, you're emotionally unbalanced, and you're like, oh man, what's going to happen? It's like, I got this going on, I, I, there's a lot of things happening in my life that I don't have answers to, and it's be- bringing trouble into my life, and it's generally, like I said, connected to emotions. And so we know that we're not to be led by our emotions, because our emotions can lead us down some pretty bad roads. We need to be led by the truth. We need to be steadfast. Emotions, as I like to describe it, is more as a barometer. Emotions tells us, you know, that something's up. It's just a barometer, you know? So if, uh, if I'm overwhelmed by anxiety, it's, my emotions are telling me, hey, something's up in your life. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be brought to the feet of Jesus. It needs to be subjected to His power and His authority. But it's not to, to uh, call me to say, let me go with those emotions and see where they lead. And the, and the vast majority of people live like that, you know? And we could get caught up in that. I mean, we're not, we're not immune to that. You know, we're all still guilty of, of finding ourselves caught up in emotions and making, as they say, emotional decisions. But this challenge here, this commandment that Jesus is giving, is now moving past the emotional aspect of it. And now this is a, a more a heartfelt character type of command that's based on not emotion, but on a choice, a choice, a choice to either love or not to love. A lot of people say, well, may argue that they they may say that, you know what, well, love's not really a choice, you know, and they may point to uh, parents, you know, for their children. We have this innate love for our children. But even then, I mean, there's parents that have no love for their kids, And vice versa, there's kids that have no love for their parents. And so they have chosen not to be involved. They've chosen to shut themselves down, you know, as far as a responsibility to love. And they've decided that I'm not going to love. But yet this commandment that Jesus is giving us is presented in a matter, a command is just that. It's an order, but then we have to choose to either obey it or not to obey it. And we all know good and well that that the Lord is not in the business of twisting arms. He is not in the business of twisting arms. He may position us through life circumstances and allowing things to happen in our life to come to a place of bended knee. 
but not a position of twisting an arm. And there's a big difference. The bend a knee is the, is, is the individual, the person on bend a knee is the individual who says that, you know what, I've come to a place of understanding that I need to humble myself. Humble, be, humble myself before my God. An emptying of self. But it's a beautiful command. Like I said, this is not an emotion, but a choice. Now, I guess the question should be right away, is because, you know, as I'm, as I'm sharing these, these words, especially in the area of love and loving, as Jesus says, loving one another, you know, immediately there's probably in your mind's heart people that are popping up right now in your life, as well as in mine, that just, quite frankly, you don't want to love for whatever the reason may be, you know? Maybe they did you wrong. Maybe you feel that, you know what, they slighted you or they talk behind your back or they give you a hard time or they owe you money or they, whatever the case may be, man, you know? Whatever you put there as, as, the, as the, the reason why not to love them and, and you've run with it. And maybe some of you has just happened over, the, over this weekend or some of you have been holding on to this for years towards certain people. And so this morning's command is, is a challenging one. It could even be rather stinging. But I guess the question is, why should we love? Why should we love? There's numerous reasons, but one that comes off the top of my head is because we are commanded to do something by the Lord. It's a command. I mean, that one in and of itself should probably suffice and and. and satisfy every other reason or excuse or however you want to present it to not love. I mean, what more do we need than, than our Savior to say, I'm commanding you to love one another. And it's important, it's important. It's important that we love. You know, we've been created for community. We have been created for community. Look at all the different organizations. Look at all the different fads. Look at all the look at all the look at all the bars. <laughs> yeah, I mean bars are popular for a reason, because it gives people a sense of community. They come like mindedness to hang out. You know, they get a little, they start getting a little intoxicated, and they start sharing each other's heart and about life and oh man and and all the woes and you know and it's like hey I'm in good company right now you know, but it's a sense of community. And you know, they're like, I love you, brother. I love you, bro. I love you too, man. You know, starts to start spilling out, you know. Now we know that's a, as a, in a perverted manner and not the way God intended, but nonetheless, there's this des- desire for community and it, and it stems from love. We're created in His image. You know, the other reason that we should love is is the, the important one here as far as the lesson that Jesus is, is teaching us this morning as well as he was with the disciples, and that's for the purpose that the world will know Jesus and that he lives. That he lives. How will they know this? Well, it's by the way that we love. You know? It's by the way that we love. That's how the world knows that Jesus lives. Because they see it demonstrated outwardly that there's this response to this beautiful love that lives today. You see? You know, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the natural, you know, I love my wife. But the moment that I take my last breath, well, I can't love her anymore. Because that's it. On this side, it's done. And so... Her, the memory of, of my memory would maybe live on in the, in the things that she does in her life. Or maybe not. That would be up, up to her, you know. But the point is, is that that love that I have that is, is, is done. The Romans teaches us that, you know. We have the law, but the moment that we take our last breath here on this side of eternity, that law is over, you know. But yet... Because Jesus lives, his love lives. And his love impacts our lives. 
or it should be impacting our lives. See, our lives haven't been changed by this, you know, uh, nebulous force or philosophy. Our lives have been impacted by a real love, by a living love from the living God. And, and the Bible talks about our cups being overflowing, you know, by this love. And in an overflow, we know that, you know, anybody who's ever had any plumbing problems at home, when the plumbing bursts, there's an overflow. And it just doesn't affect that small little area. It goes all over the place and it affects everything, right? And especially if you have carpet, you know, the whole carpet is ruined. Well, conversely, you know, the overflow uh, of our lives from the love of God shouldn't be ruining lives. It should be making lives better, you know. But it's still, nonetheless, it's an overflow. But that's how the world comes to know that he lives is through the lives of his children, of his followers. Turn with me real quick to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1. This is the command or the exhortation that we receive from Paul. And he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in what? In love. And we know that this love that uh, the Bible refers to here, and especially the, the love that Jesus is referring to, is agape. Is agape. Agape love. The, the unconditional love. You know? Be... Uh, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. So there it is, right? Is that continuity, that you know what? That we love because He first loved us. And gave Himself up for us. And now that love isn't past tense, it's a continual. He loved us and He's continuing to love us. An offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So this love is just that, that goes up to the Father, went up to the Father as something pleasing. We know the Bible teaches that the Father was well pleased by bruising His Son. He was pleased by the sacrifice. That sacrifice was a sacrifice of love. It was, again, a tangible, physical sacrifice that demonstrated how much He loved us. He gave His life for us. Look at 1 John chapter 4. Most of you are familiar with this, uh, with these verses. But in First John chapter four, the disciple, uh, the apostle John, writes this, beginning in verse seven. He says, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God." And it knows God. And we know that this word knows is, is that, that ex, to experience God. It's going to know. Because everyone who uh, loves God, uh, knows Him, knows God, has experienced God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. By this the law, I mean sorry, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him in this love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And so that's a duty, a duty to love. We have a duty or responsibility to love one another. You know, you could almost say that the command, and we'll see shortly in, in verse 14, that the command is almost, is almost like a, it's almost rhetorical, you know? It's almost a rhetorical command because, like I said, we do have the option to love, but do we really? I mean, how, how can we not respond to such an amazing love? How can there not be a response? I mean, you have to be pretty cold-hearted to not respond to the love of God that's been shown to you. 
I mean, your heart has to be stone cold, you know? If you truly have experienced the love of God, it's almost a, like, a, it's like a contradiction if you're not showing that same love to others. If your heart's not breaking for those who are lost, you know, it's just, you see the people who are walking around so bitter, and yet, that's no life, man. That's no life. And having such a richness in His love in our, in our hearts, how can we refuse not to share that with others? When we live, when we live in such a manner as described in these verses, when we live in such, a, in such a way or in such a manner, the emotions, the emotions, because that's, that's usually what may keep us from loving the difficult ones to love, our emotions, you know? It's like, I'm not going to love them. They don't, what, deserve it. Have you ever said that? They don't, des- they don't deserve my love, man. Why? You know? I mean, look how mean they are. They don't deserve it. And so that's, that's an emotional statement. It's very emotional. You're allowing that emotion of, of resentment to basically sit on the throne of your heart and then affect the mind in that decision-making process to say, mm-mm, you know, uh, bad taste in my mouth equals no love for you. <laughs> but when we live in such a way, loving, because we've been loved, and in that overflow, the emotions will follow. They will follow. And we begin to discover the treasure of people. We're a treasure to the Lord. You know, we're, uh, as we read this, this morning in the psalm, that you know, we're the apple of His eye. We know that's primarily to the Jews, but you know what? It's the Bible's for us as well. And we're the apple of His eye. He loves us. We're treasured to Him. He pursues us. You know? We're, we're the, 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 the best of His creation. Us. He's given us that ability to actually love. A lot of people are convinced that animals love. I don't know. You know? I, I, I even say it... To, Myself personally, you guys know that we have three dogs, and I love dogs. And you know, we come home and and let Harley inside the house, and he goes crazy, and he's ah, and then now he's now uh, Alicia's actually trying to go kisses, kisses, kisses. So he comes up and he goes, you know. I, I think if if push came to shove, and you know there was no food in the house, those kisses would actually turn into I'm just tasting you, and I'll eat you if I have to, man. You know, <laughs> I'm about to starve, man. I'm a dog, you know, but. But that expression, the expression of love, true love, in, this, in the sense of sacrifice has been given to us, you know? Been given to us as humans, as people. But like I said, when you get to know people, when, when you set aside the emotion, and you begin to love because it's been commanded for us to do, because we love the Lord, you know? Even if you have to do that, to say, you know what, Lord? Emotionally, emotionally, I am just not, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there emotionally to love this individual or these people, where the case may be. But because you love me, Lord, and because in response to your love for me, that is why I'm going to do it. And because I want to obey the command that you've given me, Lord, as, as, as challenging as it may be for me. And then, and then you take that step of faith and you begin to just do that work of love you know, that is tangible, that is visible, that is self-sacrificing. And, and you're going to start to see a change. The, the emotions will come when all of a sudden, you know, because we're all good at putting up facades. You know, the hypocrisy, right? Is that the hypocrisy in, in theatrics is actually the mask and we become hypocrites and we, we could put on a show every day. A lot of people are very good at putting on a, a good front and saying, you know what, uh, they actually put on the, the face of anger, you know, or, or, or rudeness, or the case may be. It's really, it's to keep people at bay. Because they don't want people to approach and start probing into, you know, questions about their lives. And so, you know, it's a front. And so they treat people poorly on purpose. To keep them outside of, of that, you know, of that uh, 
emotional zone for themselves that you know what heaven forbid people start probing into my life and then all of a sudden they start finding out the realities you know I shared with my wife uh, one of our one of my um, uh, friends from the cycling world uh, it's it's a, her birthday and she received a card from her dad and inside the card was uh, five dollars she's in her 40s right and, and so it's just a picture yeah but then all of a sudden you begin to read she says I'm posting this for a reason because this came from my dad my dad who's homeless yeah who's homeless and who is a great man who I love dearly but who has chosen to be homeless because he doesn't want to participate in the rat race of life and this is what brings him his peace and yet the five dollars comes from his heart the first person I thought about was Jesus because Jesus was homeless too, right? You know? And yet he gave all. And, and then she finishes by saying, so the next time you see a homeless person, you know, if you find in your heart to give him $5, because you never know, it might end up with their daughter. You know? But talk about opening up. Now see, it's like something like that, a situation like that. How many of us, how many of us, you know, if our parents, if our dad was a homeless individual, you know, uh, and, and chose to be homeless and, 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 and just couldn't function and, and we kept it to ourselves. And so then all of a sudden when conversations start coming up about parents and we don't want to share, what do, what do you think your natural reaction is going to be? You're probably going to want to change the subject or something like that. Or you may be, you might, may be even bitter about it and say, you know what, who needs parents, man? Parents, it's, they're horrible. Most parents are horrible. And then it's like, oh, how dare you talk about parents like that? You, you know? And then all of a sudden you get emotional about it. Instead of allowing love. Love you know, to be preeminent in your life. To Christ to be preeminent in your life. To say, you know what? I don't know. I don't know everything about this individual. What, what, why would they react in that manner? Don't know. But I can't allow myself to get caught up in that emotional aspect of it and then all of a sudden become basically converting myself into some type of victim. Because we're good at that, aren't we? I mean, come on, let's confess. We're, we're, you know, we're good at putting ourselves on a pedestal and saying, how dare you treat me the way you treated me? And, and, you know, and then all of a sudden now becoming a victim and saying, well, I'm not going to budge until they budge. And, and, and it's like, hmm. But who are we? I mean, who are we to do that? But like I said, when we take that step of faith in the name of Jesus, for His name's sake, so that others would know Him and that He's alive, our emotions will follow Him before you know it. You know, you see people in a whole different light. You know, it reminds you of the story, you guys are familiar with it, no, the end of the spear? Have you guys seen that story, you heard about that story? As a matter of fact, I have the DVD if you ever want to watch it, but it's about a missionary. I believe he goes into the jungles of Brazil, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, and he goes there to share the gospel, begins to befriend the indigenous people there, uh, but it's, something went terribly wrong, and, and they ended up killing the missionaries. And so years later, the son went back, and he hated those people, hated them, because they killed his father. But something happened. And he has began to you know, humble himself and allow the love of God to rule and reign in his heart. He began to minister and then eventually found the very man, the very man who killed his father, who murdered his father. He didn't kill him. He murdered his father. And, and, and slowly but surely, the Lord began to do work in the son's life. And the, the father, eventually, the, the man who killed his dad eventually came became a Christian and repented and asked for forgiveness and now they actually go around to different churches and 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 share this story and this son now calls that man I believe I think he calls him grandpa because of his age but I'm not too sure either grandpa or dad but you know it's like that's the power of love that's the power of Christ Jesus to be able to look at the, at, at, the, at the person who murdered your father in the eyes and say, I love you. Genuinely. Genuinely. Because when you think about it, 
You know, as far as human beings, the worst act that we can do, that we're capable of, and, and it's part of free will, you know, it, it wouldn't be complete free will if we didn't have the free will to take a life. But that is the maximum, that is the maximum that we can do, you know, and it's recorded there, obviously, in the book of Genesis. That was, that, you know, talk about right out of the gates, you know, the worst, the worst act possible. A brother taking the life of another brother out of envy, out of covetedness, you know, out of jealousy, and, that, and then just, you know, plotted out that murder in his heart and then acted upon it. But that's the maximum act. So I guess the question would be, is that, you know what, and, and even then, and even then, the Lord calls us to love, to forgive. Sure, there's the world laws and so on and so forth that take care of those things and let it be. But I, my question is this, who amongst us, at least I, I can't say that, who amongst us, I know that doesn't include me, but I've never experienced that in my life. So I've never experienced the maximum of what one human being can do it to another. And so, who am I to hold anything else that doesn't even come close to taking the life of somebody else against somebody? Think about that. You know? And yet, our own Savior, we know His words, right? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They're on the cross as they're taking, or as they thought, they were taking His life. They, uh, as they hung Him up as just, as just some... You know, thief and, and, and just guilty of nothing, but still nonetheless they crucified him. And yet he's asking the Father, just forgive him. Still showing love. He goes on to say in verse 13, why should we love? Why? Because he explains it, not necessarily you know, saying, well this is why, but as we continue in the words in the proper context, he says, you know, love one another, because greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. The highest expression of love is a self-sacrifice which spares not life itself. Again, let me say that. The highest expression of love is a self-sacrifice which spares not life itself. You know, we know that the Bible tells us in Romans, you know, because all of us could immediately think, well, I'd, I'd be willing to lay down my life for my family, and I laid down my life for you guys, you know, on certain days. <laughs> Just teasing. But, you know, and then, and then, you know, and you start, you kind of like, you go the inner circle, right? For those, yes. They go a little bit further out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd still do it. And then you go a little bit further out. And it's like, well, maybe. Maybe, maybe. And then you go a little bit further out. Oh, no way. <laughs> you know? No way. Right? It was like, a, like that joke about, uh, you know, the two being in the woods and they come across a bear. Says, oh, my gosh, there's a bear. And he says, they're going to eat us. He's going to eat us. He's like, dude, I just need to worry about one thing. That I can run faster than you can. You know? And it's like, we become like that. I, I, no way I'm going to give myself up for you. But yet, Jesus says there's no greater love than that. No greater love. So, But think about it. First, he challenges to love one another. He knew them. He knew them. That these guys w were at each, other, at each other's throats at times. You know? As the Bible says, we don't have... Oh, the full volume of the life of Jesus. If we don't have the full volume of the life of Jesus, much less the full volume of you know, the disciples and all the you know, things that they got caught up in themselves. You know? We have glimpses here and there. It's like, well, you know, we want to be at your side, Jesus. And, you know, and then John, bring down thunder on these people, man. Just destroy them. So we get glimpses. We get glimpses of their nature. And, and so we could kind of read into that a little bit, but not too much, but you could well imagine hanging out together for three years. You don't think that they had, you know, the locking of the horns? Oh, you bet. You bet that they probably locked horns plenty of times. Like, hey, well, why'd you eat that last piece of food, man? Didn't you know I was hungry? You know? 
It's like, we're rolling with Jesus, who's love. That's how you're going to treat me? And we love to throw people on the bus like that, right? And you call yourself his follower? Well, you call yourself a follower? Look how you're yelling at me now. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Jesus, hey, love one another. You know? But he throws that out first. Love one another. And then, and then he says, you know, but there's no greater love than to lay down your life. So you could just imagine how they're looking at each other going like, oh, man, for these guys? Now, now you know that he was preparing them for the future, right? And, and, and just like for us, we may not have that experience to the degree of martyrdom, but there's definitely daily experiences that we have where we're laying our hearts down, our, our pride and our, our, you know, our self-centeredness down. We're laying self down you know, for the love of somebody else. And that's the daily challenge. But like I said, the highest expression is to you know, not even consider your own life. And that's what Jesus did. He didn't consider himself. He did not consider himself. Innately, we're good at, at protecting our own hides. We're good at that. You know? I, I, I see it in the Rylongs, especially when they, when they you know, get a group of kids and they start kind of like, you know, uh, investigating and, 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 you know, these homies that were so close, all of a sudden become um homies. <laughs> they unfriend each other. And some just throw each other under the bus. They don't care, you know. That wasn't my idea, man. It's his, you know. It's like, hey, man, I wasn't carrying it. He was carrying it. And, and that's how they do it, you know. And yet, they have this professed love for one another. And, you know, this, this you know, family type thing. But yet, when, when the rubber meets the road, boom, they're, they're running, we see that expressed when Jesus, uh, when they came for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? When the soldiers came and, 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 and Judas le- leading the charge. And then all of a sudden the Bible says in Luke that they all scamper. They all, they all, and it was prophesied that they were going to leave him hanging. You know? And yet, and yet, you know what? Somewhere along the road you have to wonder as they're running and, and hiding that these words didn't come back a little haunting and, you know, going like, man, he said to love one another and that there's no greater love than to lay down your life for a friend. What am I doing? You know? Turn with me real quick to First John, back to First John, chapter 3, and look at verse 16. It says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. For the brethren. He laid down his life for us, and in return, we're to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, we know that that the ministering, you know, uh, love... Or charity begins where? In the home. Begins in the home. But it doesn't end there. Because you see, when, when we train our children in His ways, when, when we as a church are, are submitting ourselves to His teachings and, and submitting ourselves to His love, when we're doing this, and then as, as uh, Paul wrote, there's a manifestation a manifestation. A manifestation is basically a taking over of, right? So there's this taking over of, of His love in our life, and then, and then, and then it cannot be held back. It becomes who we are. It becomes our nature, not our second nature, but our primary nature. Or as it says in Galatians, that you know we've been purchased. Uh, with, for uh, we've been purchased by His blood. We are no longer our own. We belong to Him, and it becomes a manifestation. His love becomes our nature, our first reaction. You know, we we no longer react in a fleshly way, but we become Christ-like. But when that's when that's practiced in the home, day after day, when it's practiced as a body of believers, you know, it corporately then it, it, it carries on outwardly, and God knows that. 
You see, because if we try the opposite way, think about it. If it's not if it's not practiced here in the home first, then you know what? The old it becomes the old well, you're not practicing what you preach. It doesn't work that way. It has to be inward first, then outward. See, Christ comes in our hearts, then works through us outwardly. But if you do the opposite, then becomes even works. Well, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try to love people, even though I'm not doing it at home, but I'm going to try to love people. All that's going to happen is, is that then you're going to come home and then you're going to start comparing you know, well, why is it not happening here? And you're going to start noticing all kinds of different things that perhaps you never even noticed before. And, and what I'm referring to is more of the character flaws that we all have. We all have character flaws, man. Some character flaws are left there on purpose to buffer us. <laughs> right? Amen. To buffer us into love, into humility, into, you know, uh, an expanding of territories to be more Christ-like. You know, and other character uh, flaws are then corrected by the Lord, maybe in due season. Now, as we note here, clearly this screams of sacrifice, right? Sacrifice goes hand in hand with love. It goes hand in hand with love. It, there's no way around it. If you're going to love purely, it has to be sacrificially. It has to be sacrificially, you know? Now, this, this, is, this, is, this is counter to our culture. It goes counter to our culture. You know, our, our culture says this, live for self. There's a, there's a magazine called Self. It says, what's called Self? You know? And you can learn about how to improve your life, your health, you, 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 you. And, but that's what's the title, Self, you know? It's about your dreams, about you know what you deserve, about your desires, about what you want, about what you need. You know that's the way the world present, presents it. As a matter of fact, they even encourage you know what uh, surround yourself with people who are going to help you achieve these things. Those that don't, you dump them. Right? So that, that's how it's presented. Those that aren't helping you along, you dump them. You know, uh, and, and but it's that that's. That self-absorbed mentality. But that's not the heart of Christ. How many of us would have been dumped by Him a long time ago? <laughs> you know? Or, or take it to the disciples, right? There, it's like, you know what? I mean, for the most part, I mean, look at Peter. When Jesus talks about, you know what? Uh, hey, I'm going to be crucified. And so, no! Uh, no way, man. I'll kill. <laughs> I will kill them. You're dumped. <laughs> Peter, you're dumped. That's it. You know? I'm not going to be dealing with you. You are now, you're, you're, you're messing with my dreams and, and with my desires, Peter. No. Yeah, he rebuked him. You know? It's like, ah, it's not going to kind of be like that, Peter. Actually, what's going to end up happening is you're actually going to deny me three times. You know? That's what really is going to happen. But, Myself personally, this is this is where I get challenged. It's finding that finding it and I don't even I don't even know if the word is balance. But because, you know, our our responsibility or our calling isn't to fix people. I cannot fix anybody. That's God's responsibility. His is to change hearts. To change destinies. That's his responsibility. I can't do that. And you see, I think where the problem is, where the challenge comes in, is that I, I take this, this, this command of love and I interpret it as fix them. Right? Maybe I might not articulate it like that, but subconsciously, that's how I'm behaving. See, I go, I was like, well, you know, yeah, they're pretty messed up. Well, I'm going to go love on them. Because right, and I take that mindset, I take that attitude, like I'm gonna do this in hopes that they get fixed, and and, and now I take that approach, and then all of a sudden, when they ain't getting fixed, then I get frustrated, and then my frustration then be, then turns into bitterness, and then all of a sudden I go severed. All right, 
oh, clearly God doesn't want me to do this anymore, right? You know? And, and that's, not, that's, not, that's not the calling. Agape is that is unconditional. In spite of those shortcomings you do anyway, it's more for the, for the, for the, the person who's acting out the love. That's really, I mean, ultimately who it's for. It's the person acting out the love. To have that, that same heart to, to see past those things. Or as a matter of fact, you know what? It's not even really seeing past those things. It's really just accepting those things. Whatever that thing may be that becomes then the, the, the you know, stumbling stone for you to not love. I hope I'm making sense. In my mind, I think I am. You know? You hear it more too, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, I was, I was talking to, uh, you know, because deputies can be kind of hard. And, and then, you know, you, you think about it, day after day, you know, the, the negative elements that they deal with. But this past Friday, a, a real neat conversation opened up with one of them that was, went past the superficial. Because generally it's kind of just like superficial. Because you're going on calls and they get together for a little bit, but then you, you take off again. You know, sometimes you don't get to finish a meal because you got to go. And then, uh, but this this past Friday with one of the deputies, uh, a real neat conversation opened up where I just asked a real simple question. I said, sir, do you have siblings? And he began to share about his family. And he began to share about, you know, he's, yes, I got four, I'm the middle kid. And, you know, my my siblings, they're all messed up, man. He goes, you know, they don't have jobs or this or that. And he began to share about about uh, his parents. And his parents, you know, are basically my age, you know. Mom's 47, dad's 51. He goes, and my dad, he's just all he does since I've known him, basically. He just drinks himself to death every day. And my parents just fight, and that's what their life consists of, man. And and as he's sharing this, is he was being extremely candid, and I don't think I don't think he, he at the moment he didn't really see that. But then there was a moment that he caught himself, that he was sharing more than he was really comfortable sharing, if you know what I mean. But then all of a sudden he stopped, and I just said, you know, I said, sir, it's by I said it's by God's grace that any one of us are where we're at. And he goes. There's not a night that I don't go to bed and with my head on the pillow and I think about that. That I really shouldn't be where I'm at. The way that I was raised and the whole madness of that home, I shouldn't even be where I'm at. Now, mind you, when he was sharing this story, it wasn't as clean as I'm sharing it. It just wasn't. It was in the language that he was comfortable with, in the form of expression that is where he's at. And my ears are just there to hear his heart, not his flaws, or not his sin, or any. That, that's God. But that was, like I said, such a, such a, it was icing on the cake of that ministry. Because really that's what it's all about, right? And, 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 and that's, that's a challenge that we have as believers, is to meet people right where they're at, just like Jesus did. And still does today, right? Right where they're at. And all the rawness of emotion. You know, I'm learning that there's, you know, a lot of people out there that even, Christians that, that are just a, a, an emotional mess and that God's, God is doing a beautiful work in them of sanctification and, and it's taking time. It's taking time. When, when you measure against eternity, you know, what difference does it make? But we, we want like, you know, boom, man, oh, that this person would change right now, this second. Why? Because it's, it's a burden on us, that's why. 
We all of a sudden allow it to be a burden on us. That's why I want them to change so badly. That, uh, that, that is, and I'm confessing this myself. You see, because we sit there and go like, oh Lord, that they would change, why? Why? You know, I had to ask myself, why am I so, you know, so desperate for certain individuals to change? Oh, is it because I want to see them come to the knowledge of salvation so I could see them come? Is that really my motivation? Truly? I mean, is that the purest motivation that I have? Or is it because I'm growing tired? You know? And, and it's now bugging me. And, and I, don't want, I don't want to do this anymore. You know? I, I, don't, I, I don't want to love them anymore. Right? I'm tired of putting up with their nonsense. Where they can't, right? And if I really allow God to search my heart, then all of a sudden the truth starts coming to the surface that really, you know, what's my motivation? That they'd come to the knowledge of salvation, to the beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ and see them, that their joy may be full? Or is it because I'm growing tired? You know? Let God check your heart in that. You know, like I said, I can only share my personal experience with certain situations and you know, the people that God's placed in my life. That, that, that is the case for me. I don't know about you guys, but I had to take a hard look at that. And as I was studying these verses and saying, Lord, where am I in this area of love? And he says, are you, you're not long-suffering. You are not long-suffering. And so I had to own that. The bigger challenge comes here in Matthew chapter 5. If you turn with me real quick there. And again, most of us are well-versed regarding, uh, regarding the, these verses. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43, when Jesus throws this out. And he says, again, counterculture, counterculture, but he says, you have heard it said, uh, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You could just imagine the crowd's going, okay, where's he going to go with this? Okay, because that sounds fair. You know, that's easy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? Hey, they're a group that love each other, right? Tax gatherer, tax gatherer, yeah, fist pump, uh-huh. But who hated them? The ones who they were collecting from, they despised them. And if you greet your brother only, what do you do more than others? Do not, do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's heavy. That, that's passing by the office of you know, the co-worker or boss or you know, whoever it is that you don't like and saying genuinely, good morning. You know, how was your weekend? Did you have a good weekend? I, you know, and inside you're going like, man, Lord, I really need you right now, you know? I really need you. I need you because, you know, this individual makes my life difficult. You know? Purposely. You know? Or to the neighbor, or to the family member, or, you know, or the person you wake up to, you know? You know, your spouse. It's like, you know? But he continues back to our text. So he says, you know, no greater love than that. He says, you are my friends. So, you know, basically he's, he's now uh, prophesying that, hey, this is going to be coming. You are my friends. This is an intimate statement. You are my friends. But then check this out. If, if you do what I command you. 
Talk about a prerequisite, huh? <laughs> yeah. Remember, uh, yeah, I didn't go to college. I went for a little bit, hung out, and then checked out. But for those of you who fully saw it through, <laughs> yeah, didn't you hate that word prerequisite? All right. I want to, this is my career, definitely, you know, the profession, this is the degree I want to get into, and they get, like, get all excited about that, and then all of a sudden you read about what course you need to take, oh, yeah, before you get to that, prerequisite, and you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, oh, man, and then, of course, then, is naturally, well, how badly do you want it? Do you really want to be whatever that, you know, uh, career is, or, or, or degree is, you know, to receive it? Then, guess what? You'll do the yeoman's work of the prerequisite. Go to it. And so Jesus is saying, hey, you know, how important is this friendship? Then you know what? Then you'll go out and you'll do it. You will go out and you'll do and you'll love and you'll learn how to be self-sacrificing. You know, by doing what he commands, we demonstrate, again, we demonstrate we have been chosen that we have been chosen to, or that we have chosen to accept his invitation to be friends. You know, it's, it's almost like uh, Facebook, right? People send you requests and then you go, hmm, do I accept or not? Right? And it's like, all right, I'll accept your friendship, you know? And then, and then guess what? You've just accepted all that comes along with that. <laughs> There's some crazy stuff that goes on out there. And you said yes to it. But then, but then, you know, then you love them right there where they're at. That, that's a window. That's a window to where their hearts are at, man. To me, when I see craziness, I say, I know exactly what to pray for. You know, some people put stuff that just, you know, is nonsense just to you know, get, a, you know, get a, a reaction out of people. But there are some people who literally, it is out there. And you say, I know exactly how to pray. Thank you, Lord, you know. Versus, ooh, oh man, gosh, they are so worldly. Oh, 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 oh. How, do you, how do you unfriend? How do you do this, man? You know, what did I get myself into? Oh, Lord, oh, you know? Oh, instead, why don't you pick up the phone and call and say, hey, you know what? Is everything okay? You know? Is everything okay? But it, it shows us clearly that, you know what? That, yeah, we choose. We choose that invitation. It is an invitation. When Jesus says, come, and, and then we respond to the invitation. But look at verse 15. It says, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. And without getting into much of that, but, you know, Old Testament, you know, uh, they would have them for slaves for some time, and then you'd become a doulos, because after your years of service, you had the option, stay or go. And if, if a master would treat their slave properly, you know, then they say, you know what, why should I leave? I got a good here, you know. I get, I, I get treated well. I got a good roof over my head. And you know what, we're flourishing here. And they would go and they would, you know, pierce their ear and they'd become a doulos. But Jesus is saying here, you know what, you know, there's no longer a distinction. And again, this is now, he's, he's uh, given an inclination regarding going back to what he taught earlier regarding the Holy Spirit. You're going to know a whole lot more. You're going you're gonna to be in the know. You're going to be in the know of the things of the kingdom and all that's transpiring. He says, uh, But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made it known to you. You did not choose me. You know, just in case they start things like, Oh, wow, I have the option. You know, what a great privilege that I could choose. No, no, no. You were chosen first. And again, this is to solidify the fact that even God chooses to love us. He's God. He doesn't have to love us. You know? But His, his nature is love, and so He's choosing to love us. And then again, He demonstrates that by sending His only begotten Son. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, appointed you that you should go and bear Fruit, going back to that whole, you know, the whole theme of this, the whole purpose behind loving one another, the whole, you know, all that's going to be coming down the road. Fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit. How do you do it? By loving one another, by obeying, by staying connected, but ultimately for the purpose of bearing fruit. 
and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. So, again, clearly, he has chosen us. He has chosen to love us. Jesus actually, again, laid everything aside. We know that. That he, he emptied himself out. The kenosis. He emptied himself out, you know, for us. Turn with me real quick to Romans 5.8. No, sorry. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. He says, uh, Paul writes, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, us. We were ungodly. The Bible clearly teaches us that at one time we were enemies of God. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. Paul here is, 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 is driving home, ultimately what he's going to show us here is obviously the depth of his love for us. But God demonstrates... Sorry. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, oh sorry, we'll just stop there, that he died for us even though we were sinners. So that, that, uh, that outward, again, that outward demonstration of love that he shows, that he chose us and then laid it all aside to die for us. The King of Heaven laid his crown aside to come die for us, you know? We get that image. We, we you know, there's, there's people who are in high positions in this world, you know, whether they're political or maybe they're, uh, you know, um, artists or the case may be. And, you know, and we get the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Remember that program? And they go, and, or, you know, on MTV, you know, what was it called? Cribs? You know, and you go into you go into the crib, and you get to see all the beautiful things, and how you know the house is beautiful, and all these luxuries that they have. Well, the last thing you could imagine someone like that of that you know power or position from the world standpoint is to come to your house and say, "Hey, I, I heard uh, I heard your dog needs washing. Want me to give it a bath?" You'd be like, "Oh man, no, be my guest. You know, you you're not gonna." Oh my gosh, you're you're famous, you know? No. It's like what can we do for you? That's that's mostly how people react, right? That's why rich people don't spend a lot of money cuz everybody wants a piece of them. And so they they toss stuff at them for free all the, all day long, you know? I mean, the Academy Awards, I can't remember which which actress it was, but she went up there and gave her little speech regarding, you know, equal rights for women and what have you not. It's like you're a millionaire, lady. Your gift bag was worth like $180,000, you know? You want to give it quality? Go give some money away, you know? <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's like, so it's like those, that type of mindset or, or someone like that for the world, when those people come in their lives, they're the opposite. They want to be at their feet and their beckoning call. But yet Jesus, who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, laid it all aside, humbled himself, to come, come, to come give His life as a sacrifice for you and for me so that we would know the Father's love and how deep and how wide and how high, you know? That's the basis of, of, of our actions is the, the magnitude of that love, knowing this, that when we love purely as Christ has loved us, we can't exhaust that love. We cannot exhaust that love. Come what may... We all know what's going on right now in the Middle East, right? And you know, the right now we're praying for the uh, our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. You know, the Christians there, and the, Assyri- the Assyrian Christians, and the Coptic ones that recently were beheaded publicly. You know, uh, and it's like it's horrific. It's horrific. But I don't know if you've seen. Uh, you know, they have peace. This incredible peace. These men, they're not, they're not, it's like, you know, begging for mercy from their, from their captors. You know, uh, there's some videos that are circulating that if they zoom in close enough, some of them are crying out to Jesus. You know? That's heavy. Easily, they could be sitting there going, ah, don't, you know, and, 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 you know, 
swearing up a storm to their captors. But they're in peace. I, I firmly believe that. You know what? If should we ever come to that place, you know, right now maybe some of you, you know, you see our, our fellow brothers and sisters being more like that, and you you shudder. You go, like, "Oh Lord," you know, man. Heaven forbid that ever starts happening here, at least before you come, you know. But you know what? Know this. The Lord would be with you and you would be equipped. You would be equipped, you know. And, and again, if God can equip us for that maximum amount of showing love, come on, can He not help you to overcome all the other really... Nothing with others? Of course he can. Of course he can. But will you let him? Because that's the real question, you know. So Romans 5 clearly tells us out of this, we go we, we go, and we bear fruit. And, and, and not only are we commanded to bear fruit or because of the result of this, but also too we're ordained. We're ordained to serve. You know, he says that you go bear fruit. That, that is an ordination. You will go and bear fruit. We are personally ordained by God. You don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be you know, on staff at a church. You don't need to be an elder or anything like that or involved in some big ministry. Each and every one of us who's been chosen by the Lord has been ordained by the Lord to bear much fruit. And he equips us with that insight. And then finally, verse 17, we'll end here, says, This I command you, that you love one another. It's like, you know, it's the old, uh, I've mentioned it numerous times before, you know, we come here Sunday after Sunday, and I jokingly say sometimes, like when my wife goes to church or, or I go to a men's Bible study, she comes, I come back home, she says, so how'd it go? I was like, it went well. She goes, what they talk about? Uh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah? Went to church and, shocker, talked about Jesus, you know? <laughs> talked about God, you know? But I say that, I say that, you know, obviously just to joking around, but really, it, the, the reality is, is that we need that over and over and over and over again. God knows how quickly we lose sight of Him, of His love for us, and, and we need repetition, repetition, and repetition. I mean, love one another, then, oh yeah, love one another. And hey, by the way, love one another. And then he goes on in John 17 in his prayer that they would be one, that they would love one another. As you and I, Father, love one another, they would be one, that they would be one, that they would be one. And where are we today? <laughs> right? But yet, it's that, it's, it goes to show us, be persistent. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart, you know? Do not lose heart. Uh, continue pouring salt. Continue being light. Continue loving. See, again, we get in this mindset that it's for the purpose of, of, of you know, self-gratification, or I say, shouldn't say self-gratification, but immediate change, and, and then for, you know, this, this thing to happen Throughout the whole world, that all of a sudden everybody loves God, and then everybody's getting along, and there's peace everywhere in the world. Well, it's not going to come in that manner as far as now. We know eventually there's going to be the Prince of Peace on this earth, and we know that the Bible teaches that there'll be a semblance of peace, okay? But we ain't aiming for utopia. We're not aiming for utopia. And, and even at the, as the world continues to get darker, Still be light. Because that's what we've been called to do. That is our calling. You know, God didn't say, be light, but only if you see change. Once there's no change, then stop being light. You know? <laughs> he didn't say that. There's nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You know? Or salt or love. He says, that, this command, just love. How long? Just love. There's no expiration date on it. Just love. You know? Now, his love, you know, this verse 17, his love is, is, is not the world's love, obviously. It's not the definition of the world's love. The world's love is very contingent on, it's, it's very uh, fleshly, you know. I will do what I love to do. You ever heard that, right? You know, this is what I love to do, so what, you know. You share the love of Christ, you share the need for repentance, and what do they say? You know, well, now you're judging me, you know. What difference does it make? I love what I do. 
and I don't think it's hurting anybody, and so long as I love it and it's not hurting anyone, I'll continue doing it. That's not, that's not the love of Christ. You know? So we know this, that it's a different definition of the, than what the world's definition is, and we're going to read more about that next week. Obviously, read ahead, you know? However, it is the only true and real love. It is the only true and real love. And it is His love that we obey and live by. It's the only true love, the only real love, and it's the, it's the love that we live by and that we obey, you know? Because His love is redeeming love. It's redeeming love. This is a fallen world that needs to be redeemed, that can only be redeemed by His love through repentance of sin and turning to Christ as Savior. It's the only way. And, and he's, He shares that message of His redeeming love through His saints. And we're going to see next week that not everyone is as receptive. <laughs> and not as receptive to His love. And there's sometimes adverse reaction. But again, let's not lose heart. You know, let's... Let's decide collectively that we're going to love no matter what. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we, we have such a blessed time, Lord God, hearing from your word, Lord Jesus, because it's such an encouragement. We all, Lord God, as your children, as your sons and daughters, come across the challenges of, of having this agape love for others, Lord God. Help us, Lord Jesus, to... Lord God, accept where people are at and, and, and accept in our hearts the knowledge and the fact, the truth that only you can change hearts and minds and that that is your doing, that is your responsibility. You are the only one that has that power. And with that in mind for us, Lord God, ours is just to love, to meet them where they're at, to have a, a lending ear, to really hear past the noise and hear the suffering, the brokenness, the hardness of the hearts, Lord God, so that we would be able to minister effectively, to pray fervently, Lord God, to sow that seed, to come and water and to rejoice when you make it grow. It is not for us, Lord God, to come, to come against anyone, Lord, but just to love. That love first starts here, in the body of believers, that we would love one another, Lord God, that it would be an overflow, that it would be contagious, that it would be radical, that the world would see that you're alive by this love and that they would come to know you and be saved. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen.